control and with thanksgiving I'll be a living sanctuary Lord for you Lord prepare me to be a sanctuary Pure and holy, tried and true, and with thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary, Lord, for you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lord, prepare us to be a living sanctuary, <laughs> pure and holy, tried and true. But we know we can't do it without you. Father God, we truly thank you for this is the day that you have made it. We shall rejoice and be glad in it. We come to you, O oh God, presenting ourselves, a living sacrifice to you, O oh Lord. Prepare us, O oh God, for your word on today. Prepare us, O oh God, to allow your Holy Spirit to have free reign in this service on this morning. We thank you, oh God, in advance for a word that will encourage us, that will inspire us, that will enlighten us, that will strengthen us, oh God, that we may do your good and perfect will. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen, amen. Our scripture lesson on this morning is coming from the book of John in the New Testament, John chapter 16 verses 5 to 15. John chapter 16, verses 5 to 15. And I will be reading the New King James Version, and it reads, But now I am going to him who sent me, yet none of you ask me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the advocate or the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will prove the world, that is prove or convict the world of wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment about sin because they do not believe in me, about righteousness because I am going to the Father and you will see me no more, about judgment because the ruler of this world has been condemned. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own, but will speak whatever he hears, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, because he will not take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. For this reason I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Uh, on this morning, if you will go with me, let us take our text from uh, we're going to start, it's actually a couple of verses here that we're going to use for our text on this morning. We're going to take verses um, 8, verses 8, 9, and 10. And I want to use, if I could, a subject for a subject this morning, to tell the truth. To tell the truth. Jesus made a promise to the disciples here that when he left them, that he would send another, an advocate, the spirit of truth. He gave it two distinct uh, characteristics of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is the only means by which believers can be empowered for the task of building the church that is making disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. See. He must be actively involved in our daily lives if we are to successfully navigate Christian living in this world under the bondage of sin and evil. The Holy Spirit, he, he is the one who can 
help us to control our thoughts so that uh, we can have the mind of Christ, and that is to think his thoughts, to think his truths. In our scripture lesson, Jesus said the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor recognizes him. You, you who believe, know him because he lives with you and will be in you. Important, he will, he lives with you and will be in you, okay? Therefore, it is important that we know what the Holy Spirit does for us, what he does, not just for us, but for the whole world. We must know uh, what it is Jesus sent this third person of the Godhead, whom we call the Trinity, to do in the life of the born again believer, that we may be uh, all God intends for us to be and do all that God intends for us to do. You see, just as Jesus knew the persecution and the troubles that lay ahead for the disciples during that time, he also knows the same of you and me who are followers of him today. It is part of our human uh, atomic DNA, if you will. Uh, it, it's something that was passed down to us from Adam, that when we are faced with the opposition and, and, and the hatred of the world because we are believers, we might easily become tempted to be extreme in separating ourselves from the world or being silent in it altogether. Uh, Adam, when he had sinned, he, he hid from God. And, and when God called and said, Adam, where art thou? He, he was silent for a moment. He didn't readily admit where he was. He hid from God. He separated himself from God because of his sin. So yes, there are those who believe that they should live separate from the world and not have association with those who are of the world. You know, that's the mindset of some who profess to be Christians. There, there are also those who establish communities to isolate themselves from those who do not follow their teaching. See, persecution and opposition from non-believers also causes many Christians to just be silent about who they are and what they believe. They do not witness, that is, they, don't, they do not share their saving faith in Jesus Christ with the lost, the non-believers. And this certainly does not answer the call to Jesus' great commission in Matthew 28 and 18 to 20, where he commands us to do what? Go and make disciples of all nations. Underline that, underscore that all nations, not just a select group, but all mankind, every one of us. Jesus said he came uh, that we would have life and have it more abundantly. He, he came, God gave his only begotten son he, so that none of us would perish, but that all of us, all, not just the select few, but all of us would have everlasting life, not just the Jews, um, but all of us, all of us who are of the seed uh, of Adam, the seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So, these reactions that we just talked about here, uh, the silencing ourselves, the uh, withdrawing ourselves from the world and making it seem as if we're the holy ones because we don't interact with the world because we are Christians and they're not. That's not God's plan. These reactions to the world's opposition uh, uh, to true saving faith gives insight to what John said in chapter 15 and in verse 26, where he quotes, he, re, he reminds us that Jesus said these two things. Jesus used two names for the Holy Spirit. He called him advocate or helper or comforter and the spirit of truth. And there's a lot of uh, of blessings and benefits wrapped up into these two names. And Jesus just summed them all up in these two names, the advocate and the spirit of truth. See, there are those professing Christianity who follow what is called this doctrine of separation, and it deals with these levels called first degree and second degree of separation from the world. And I don't really want to get into that right now, but it is uh, definitely something to consider as a good Bible study because there are those today who use the scripture to support these teachings of non-fellowship, um, a, a, a separation from the world, which is not in keeping with the ministry of Jesus Christ that we are to, to continue in the world today. Jesus never separated himself 
from the lost and unbelievers. In fact, he went to them. Okay, so this separate this 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 doctrine of separation is a false teaching, and but scripture, and that's how we have to be careful of, as Christians today, because these people who are wrongly using scripture to justify their position and their doctrine and their teaching. And that is yet another reason as we go on, you'll find out why we need the Holy Spirit. Amen. So ministry uh, that cannot be carried on without the helper, the Holy Spirit, the one who is both our advocate and our spirit of truth. We cannot do what God called us to do uh, to carry on the ministry of Jesus Christ without the help of the Holy Spirit. So this Christian walk by faith is not easy. And Jesus understood that. He knew that. He knew what lay ahead, just like he did for the disciples. He knows what lies ahead and for us. And so uh, he didn't want their faith to waver, nor does he want ours to waver or be destroyed today because of these untruths and misconceptions that are out there uh, afloat in the world today. You know, back in the day, uh, so to speak, as the apostles witnessed, the Holy Spirit did the persuading, convicting, and the people were saved. As their advocate, the Spirit was the apostle's source of help, encouragement, and strength. He, he ministered to their hearts uh, in that capacity um, as their advocate. He was ministering to their heart so that their heart would not grow faint, that they would not grow weary and well-doing, that they would not become discouraged, that they would not become weak in their faith uh, because of the opposition. And as the spirit of truth, he, he taught them, the Holy Spirit taught them, he enlightened them and he reminded them. And that's what I was talking about earlier, reminded them of the scriptures, reminded them of the truth of the scriptures, amen? Because there are lies associated with the scripture and then there's the truth. And God would have us to know what? Always the truth. And the Holy Spirit will remind us of the truth lest we fall prey to the untruth, to the lies. Because after all, Satan is the author of lies. The truth is not in him. But God is the God of the truth, amen? He, so the Holy Spirit ministered in this respect with the teaching and the enlightenment and the reminding them, he ministered to their mind. You see, as believers, we have to have our whole heart and our whole head in the business of advancing the kingdom of God in the earth by telling the truth. We cannot tell what we do not know. And the only way we will know the truth is by the spirit. This Bible tell, declares that, that to know the truth, uh, that's where our freedom is. Know the truth, know the truth. Hallelujah. And you shall be set free. So the transition here, let's look at this thing. The Holy Spirit is sent to us because God wants us to know the truth. And the truth is that we are not alone in this world of opposition to us carrying out the Great Commission. We're not in this thing by ourselves. We're, we're not the purpose of the church. The whole purpose of the church is the fulfilling of the Great Commission. And we're not in this. God didn't just give us this commission and say, now go do it without any help. He's with us. And he's given us all things pertaining to life and godliness. He's given us everything we need to be successful in carrying out this Great Commission. We've got this thing. Come on, my brothers and my sisters in Christ. We've got this. If we allow the Holy Spirit to do what he was sent to do, to expose the truth to this dark world, he does the heavy lifting for us. We just have to rely on him, depend on him. Amen. And so let's look at this thing. In verse eight of our scripture lesson, Jesus says this about the Holy Spirit. He says, when he comes, he will prove or convict the world of wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. So the purpose of sending the Holy Spirit from the Father is to present God's truth to the world. He came to tell the truth. He came to present or expose facts to convince the world of the truth. He works on the minds of the lost by convicting the world of wrong about these three things, sin, righteousness, and judgment. And so let's unpack these three for just a moment, and I promise you I won't be with you very long. When we look at verse 9, we see that the Holy Spirit convicts the world about sin. You see, according to Jesus, not believing in him is a sin. Sin 
And this is what sin is. And let's clear it up once and for all. Sin is rebellion against God. And the height of this rebellion was when Jesus was crucified. And so today, the greatest sin is failure to believe in Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross at Calvary for us. John records in chapter three, and you might want to jot these scriptures down because uh, we're, we're again, we're, we're, we're looking to expose the truth, not the lies and the deceptions uh, to justify our sin. So in John chapter three, verse seven, uh, verses 17 to 18, Jesus just said this. He declared this one thing. He says, indeed, God did not send the son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already because they have not believed in the name of the only son of God. So here we need to understand what it means to believe. And this is a key because there are so many people out there professing their Christianity uh, on the wrong thing, on the wrong foundation. To believe is more than intellectually or logically agreeing that Jesus is God. It's not just about what you read about and what you heard about and you're depending upon that and relying upon that. To believe means to put our trust and confidence in Jesus that he alone can save us. It is putting Christ in charge of our daily plans and eternal destiny as well as <laughs> relying on him. Many are, are good with that last part. They're, 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 they're uh, willing to trust him because they want to go to heaven. And, you know, there's, they want that heaven part of it, but they're unwilling to yield to the first part of it, which is the key to the whole thing, which is giving, putting Christ in charge of our daily plans. Look, look at this thing, putting our trust, put our trust and confidence in Jesus that he alone can save us. Put Christ in charge of our daily plans and eternal destiny. This is important. This is important. This is important because uh, we have to give control of our daily lives over to Jesus Christ if we're going to be successful in this thing called Christianity, this, this life of a Christian, this, this identity of being a Christian. This is what makes Jesus Christ not just Savior, but Lord and Savior. So lip service, just saying he is our Lord and Savior means nothing if we're not putting, putting, putting our trust and confidence in him. If we're not putting, putting him in charge of our entire life. If you're not putting, you do not truly believe in Jesus. He said, not me, uh, but that if you do not believe, I didn't tell you this, I'm not saying this, but this is what Jesus says. He says, if you do not believe in him, then you are guilty of the ultimate sin and that ends in a death sentence. The wages of sin is death. Most people do not easily admit being guilty of sin. They will, however, quickly attempt to rationalize it. We have all kinds of excuses and well, nobody's perfect and God knows my heart, this, that, and the other. We have all these ways of rationalizing it. And, and back in the day, there was the comedian that always would say the devil made him do it. Hmm, come on, somebody. But, but we have to, um, you know, folks are willing to admit failures or, 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 or vices or even crimes. And we have prisons that are that are full of some, everybody in there that declares they're not guilty, that they didn't commit the crime. There are some in, that are in prison because they admitted that they committed the crime, okay? So you may be asking, so well, aren't vices and crimes sins? And this is one of the things that, this is that fine line between the lie and the truth that Satan often trips many people up with. The, 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 the vices and the crimes, they're, they're really, fallout. They're, they're the result of, the fallout from the residue of sin. They're the cousins to sins. Uh, come on, somebody there. They're the offspring to sin. Sin, the rebellion against God leads to these vices and these crimes and these things that, that, that we find ourselves doing from time to time. Re the rebellion against God, not believing in Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. And it's the Lord part that causes us to trip up, to fall, to stumble. Hallelujah. Come on, somebody. Savior, he's already secured our place in heaven. But the Lordship part is the part that causes us to, to trip up, which is why God had to send his Holy Spirit of truth to let us know when we're not walking in his Lordship. 
It is, a, it is a powerful working of the Holy Spirit that is necessary to reveal the truth to the people about their deadly predicament. Walking that line, sitting on the fence between sin and righteousness. And speaking of righteousness, what a segue. The next thing that we look at in our scripture lesson, not only do we need the Holy Spirit to tell us the truth, you know, uh, about sin, but we also need to understand the truth about righteousness. We need to know the truth about righteousness. We need to know Because Jesus was going to the Father. He's no longer physically present. Saying about righteousness. Because, uh, this is what someone said about righteousness. It belongs to God. It's something that belongs to God alone. The lawgiver. He's the only one that can demonstrate alone. He is the lawgiver. And, and he it demonstrates this righteousness in his law. And how he does that, those the law, those Ten Commandments, because he shows us that we are unrighteous because none of us can keep all of those Ten Commandments. We've sinned in one of them. The Bible says if you keep the whole law and sin in just one part, you're guilty of it all. And so the only person that can demonstrate true righteousness is God. And so we need God in order to, the truth is we cannot be righteous. There's a lot of self-righteous folk walking around out there, but we can only be righteous through God. Hallelujah. It says no man can be justified or defended by his own works. There's nothing we can say or do that will allow us to be righteous apart from God. Therefore, righteousness is a wonderful gift from God to humanity through his love. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, his righteous son, so that we could be a part of that righteousness, so that by becoming joint heirs with Christ, we could be partakers of that righteousness. We could be counted righteousness. It is the God-given quality assigned to us upon believing in the Son of God. That's the only way we can be counted righteous in God's eyes, in right relationship with him. It's not our works. You can do, you can give millions and billions of dollars. You can be the best philanthropist there is out there. You can be the greatest volunteer there is. You can be the biggest giver, you know, you can, uh, whatever you call it, you know, whatever label you want to do, whatever act you want to do, none of it is good enough to count you righteous in the sight of God. It's already been done. The thing that satisfied righteousness for God was already done, and it was done through Jesus. Jesus Christ on the cross at Calvary. And see, when we look at verse 10, it says that we need to know the truth about righteousness because Jesus is no longer physically present in the world. Why? Because during his time on earth, it says only the righteousness, uh, only the unrighteous, amen, were crucified. This is important when you understand what the crucifixion was all about, what that great transaction was all about. During his time, only the unrighteous were crucified. And here we have, look at Galatians 3. It says, uh, it makes reference to an Old Testament verse in Deuteronomy that says, that essentially says that only a wicked person would be hanged on a tree and therefore under God's curse. So this means that the Jewish people at that time did not believe Jesus to be righteous. Otherwise, they would not have crucified him. They believed a lie. What they were believing was not the truth. Acts 3 and 14, Peter says, you disown the holy and righteous one and ask that a murderer be released to you. You kill the author, the author, my people, come on. You kill the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. And we are witnesses of this. This is Paul testifying, witnessing boldly to the crowd of people that were before him. Peter was telling the truth. Uh, and this truth was not revealed to him by flesh and blood. Both Peter's head and heart were on one accord in agreement so that he could boldly speak the truth to the people, that he could boldly witness to the people. 
So it was the resurrection and the ascension that cleared Jesus as God's righteous servant. That's what gave him once and for all the identity as the righteous servant of God. Jeff, uh, Jesus Christ's death on the cross made a personal relationship with God available to us. Righteousness, he imputed, the Bible says, righteousness to us through his death on the cross. Wow. And so when we confess our sin, God declares us righteous and delivers us from judgment for our sins. And we have to understand that this whole confession of our sin is not about, Lord, I drank too much last night. Lord, I fornicated last night. The, the confession of sin, the only confession of sin that declares us righteous is when we confess that we have transitioned, that we are converted, that we now believe. We are no longer a non-believer in Jesus Christ, the Savior and Lord of our life, but we are now a believer. That is the confession that God is looking for that will count us righteous in his sight. He already knows you still gonna, there's going to be some fornication. And I'm not saying that there's going to be some slipping up of, of whatever the vices and things that we come into contact with. But when we declare that Jesus Christ is Savior and Lord of our life, that is what imputes that righteousness. That's what declares us in right relationship with God. When Adam sinned in the garden, it didn't sever his relationship with God because God did what? If God didn't care for him anymore, he would have cast him off and we would have heard no more about him, just as it was with Judas when he betrayed Jesus Christ. But what did God do? He sat there in the garden with Adam and he prepared clothing for him and, and, and Eve and he sent them. He's like, you can't stay in the garden, but I'm going to prepare you to be to live outside of the garden. You know, we, we are in a place right now where God has prepared us through Jesus Christ for us to still be with him in this world. Just as he prepared Adam and Eve to be with him in the world outside of the Garden of Eden. Amen. So when we confess our sin, God declares us righteous and delivers us from judgment for our sins because we know the judgment is death eternal separation from him. The Holy Spirit convicts mankind and exposes the truth of their faulty views of Jesus when the gospel is proclaimed as Peter proclaimed it in Acts chapter 3. And that's what we have to be about, proclaiming the truth. So many Christians are not witnessing as a way of life today because they still in themselves do not understand the truth. I, 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 I'll be, I, I will give you that, that Satan has done a, uh, I'm not giving him any credit and I'm not glorifying him, but he's done a meticulous job of, of, of disguising and distorting the truth. And so we have to be on our game. And the only way we can be on our A game is with the help of the Holy Spirit so that we can set this thing right, so that we can proclaim the truth to the world. There are so many people lost in darkness because they do not know the truth. The light has not been shined. They're still in the darkness because we have not brought the light to them, the light of the truth of the word of God. Bible says in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Come on, somebody. We've got to bring God to the people. We've got to bring the truth to the people. And so not only do we need the Holy Spirit to, to uh, convict the world regarding sin and righteousness, but also judgment. Let's look at verse 11. And I'm about to bring this thing to a close. Verse 11 says we need to, that he's, uh, the Holy Spirit will convict the world about judgment because the ruler of this world has been condemned. The ruler, the prince of this world. So not only do we need the truth about those things, we need to know about judgment. We need to know the truth about judgment. And when we look at John chapter 12 and verse 31, Jesus said this. He said this to the people concerning his crucifixion. He says, now, praise God, is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out and I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. So the death and resurrection of Jesus were a conviction of Satan. This whole thing, you know, don't get it all twisted. Everything that Jesus did, 
uh, his resurrection, you know, was about convicting Satan guilty once and for all and condemning him to what? Eternal death. He's you're guilty and you are convicted. And how was he convicted? Because Jesus, when he rose from the dead, when his, with his resurrection, he claimed victory over death, hell, and the grave. He was victorious and Satan was defeated once and for all. But yes, he is still uh, active in, in, in the world because his final uh, death sentence has not been exacted yet. If you want to end all of the craziness and madness that's going on in this world, well, we need to be about the business of the kingdom because only when Jesus comes again, only when he returns again, will Satan be uh, uh, banished to the pit of hell, the fiery pit of hell once and for all. But yes, he's still active out there causing all kinds of hate and discontent and trouble and, and tribulation on every side because we're not um, active about what we're supposed to be doing. Here is the truth of the matter. Satan never wants you to know the truth because once you know the truth and the truth sets you free, he knows that he is condemned to the pit of hell for all eternity. And he's not trying to go there right now. And I can't blame him. But come on, somebody, we've got to be about our business lest we find ourselves being pulled down there with him. So the death and the resurrection of Jesus were a conviction of Satan. He's the, he's the prince of this world and he's a very real angel who rebelled against God. And when we are not believers, all those who are not believers, when they don't believe, they're rebelling against God. And so this is how Jesus would continue to be with the disciples after he physically left them. It is how he continues to be with us today through the resurrection and the ascension into heaven. And when he went to heaven to sit at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, he said what? He will send yet another to be with us. The Spirit of God himself would come after Jesus was gone to care for and guide the disciples as well as us believers today. This is why every believer can and should develop a growing relationship with God. Hmm. And it requires the uh, 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 abandoning the misconceptions that the Holy Spirit of God is just some force or some power and not a person. He's just as real as Satan is. You can't set your eyes on Satan visibly. It's funny how we believe everything. We, we Everybody's on board with the devil, but they, even though you don't physically see him, but when it comes to Jesus Christ, come on, folks want to, and the Holy Spirit, folks want to be in denial about it and have reasons about why it's not true. We Why, why is it? But because this is the world, and this world is the atmosphere of embracing what? The evil and not the good. But we got to turn this thing around, and we can with the help of the Holy Spirit, our advocate, our helper, our comforter, and the spirit of truth. So we've got to be about uh, hearing the truth and telling the truth. The Holy Spirit came to tell us the truth. And we've got to hear that truth, believe it in our heart, not just the head thing, but believe it in our heart and allow him to, uh, to, to, to place Jesus Christ in our hearts to transform us, hallelujah, so that we can transform the world. In the name of Jesus, we thank you, Lord, for your Holy Spirit whom you sent to tell us the truth that we may tell the truth to all those that we come in contact with, that your great commission will be fulfilled and that you would come back just like you said you would. Hallelujah. And we know that you will on that great day. And we will be found righteous in your sight because we know the truth and we tell the truth. Father God, we just thank you for this word on today. We thank you, oh God, for your Holy Spirit who tells us the truth. We thank you for the truth on today. Hallelujah. Help us to live by that truth. Holy Spirit, help us to think the thoughts of, of Jesus Christ, which are of truth and holiness and righteousness. We confess, oh God, that we have come short of your glory, that we are sinners, but saved by your grace. We thank you for your grace and your mercy on today that allows us to be declared in right relationship with you now, not because of our works, not because of anything we've done, but because of the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross at Calvary, his death, his burial, and his resurrection. In the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you, Lord. We believe in your name. 
We stand on your promises. Hallelujah. And we know that in this world, we will have trials and tribulations, but you are there with us and you will help us to navigate every obstacle that we face, whether it be uh, in our health, in our finances, oh God, uh, in whatever area, in our family situations, oh God, whatever we're dealing with, oh God, we know that we have you as an advocate in your Holy Spirit living with us and in us. Holy Spirit, have your way in us and with us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, 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 amen. I pray that someone today who has heard this message and has not yet made that decision for Jesus Christ and received him as Savior and Lord. You know, we, we, we sometimes we need to switch that thing and receive him as Lord. Because guess what? You can't receive him as Savior if you've not yet received him as Lord of your life because he, he's, he as Lord, he leads you what? to your destiny, to your eternal destiny. So we have to have him in our life in both capacities as Savior and as Lord. We can't just, uh, it's not enough to just wait for heaven, but we need him as a Lord in this dark world today. And so I just give thanks to God Almighty. The Bible declares that the angels in heaven will rejoice if one soul is one into the kingdom. And I thank God that today, somewhere, somehow, someone heard a word, hallelujah, a word of truth, and made that decision to surrender their will and their way to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of their life. And I pray that someone who has heard the word here on today will make it their business to be a conscious about uh, being a witness for Jesus Christ. It's not about Bible quoting and it's not about inviting them to church. It's just about telling them the truth about who Jesus Christ is and who he is to you, what it is you believe. Not, not avoiding people, but looking for in every opportunity to be able to, to tell them the truth, the truth, the truth about Jesus Christ. Amen. And so we also invite you to uh, become a part of our fellowship, not just the kingdom. We invite you to be a part of the kingdom of God, to become a citizen of the kingdom of God through Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. But we also invite you to become a part of Urban Memorial AME Zion Church. God is doing a marvelous work in our midst. You know, the Bible declares that the, the harvest is plenteous, but the laborers are few. And the things, when I look back over the two and a half, I'm about, about to close out this third year of ministry as a pastor at Urban Memorial AME Zion Church and all that we've accomplished with just a few laborers, my God, what can we do when more come? So we invite you to become a part, to be one of the laborers, hallelujah, to be a part taker of bringing in the harvest that God has set before us at Urban Memorial AME Zion Church. You can do that through just bringing your gifts and your talents to the body of Christ, becoming a volunteer, serving in ministry. Um, and you can also do it through financial giving because we know that everything under the sun, there is a cost for everything under the sun. It takes money. We're in this world. We like to quote that scripture, we're in this world, but we're not of it. We are in this world and in this world, everything has a cost. Everything has a price. There's something to be paid. Nothing in this world is free. Somebody paid something for it. And so we, in order for us to do ministry, there are resources, physical resources that we require, and there's a cost to those. And so we invite you to be a part of sharing in the giving of finances of, in, through tithes and offerings and donations to our ministry as we continue to do what God has called us to do, to show God to the world, to present God to the people. And so if you want to give, you can do that through Cash App, uh, which is our dollar sign Irwin Memorial, capital sign E for Irwin, capital sign M for Memorial, and then the AME Zion, all capital letters, and all of that is pushed together. And you can look for that out there on Cash App. It's a simple application. You just download it and set up a, your uh, an account that you would have the funds to transfer from. And uh, it's, it's a blessing to all of us. And then you can also mail it to us if you so desire at 716 West M Street in Irwin, North Carolina, 28339. And we will be ever so grateful. You can visit our website. It's called Emamez, E-M-A-M-E-Z, 
www.ebrickbrand.org. And you can go and see, um, I think we still have some of our, uh, there was a photo gallery, we're trying to build that up so you can see what your tithes and offerings and your gifts and talents are doing in the body of Christ through Urban Memorial and these other churches. And this is talking about it. We've got you know, boots on the ground, hands and feet, and the extension of God, hands and feet in our community. We are a church um, in the community for the community, you know, showing the love of Christ, the love of the word, and the, the love of people. And that's what we're all about. And if you want to be a part of that, join us. Amen. And so we're, we're closing out, and I just want to say this i pray that you will all be safe on this memorial weekend and take some time out to remember i'm sure all of us have someone that we're connected to that has served this country through our military um, and there are many of them who have gone on and are no longer with us so just take some time out don't just get caught up in the barbecue and the and the full-on self-pleasure uh, of, of, of enjoying this weekend, but take some time out to re remember those who have served this country to allow us to still be a free nation um, that we are today, because there are countries that are not ex experiencing the kind of freedom that we are today. And in our freedom, don't get so caught up in the freedom of doing you that you forget about the freedom that Jesus Christ has extended to all of us the freedom to do his will, his good and perfect will in the earth on today. And so now unto him who is able to keep us and prevent, present us faultless before his throne with power, might, and dominion, both now and forever, the people of God say amen, amen, and amen. God bless you and have a safe and wonderful holiday weekend.